अकाय च धर्मस्य सर्वधर्मस्वरूपिणे अवतार वरिष्ठाय रामकृष्णाय ते नम जननी शारदा देवी रामकृष्ण जगद्गु पाद पद्मे तयो श्रुवा प्रणमा मुगो नम श्री यथिराजा विवेकानंद सुरे सच्चिदुखस्वरूपाय स्वामीने तापहारिणे मै वेरी डियर एंड रिवियर स्वामी सुपरनाथ जी महाराज एंड दे असेंबल्ड डेवटीज एंड गेस्ट महाराज इज टूमेंडरस अफेक्शन एंड लव फॉर मी दैट्स व्हाई ही कीप्स कॉलिंग मी इट इज द थर्ड टाइम द लास्ट वन ईयर आई एम स्पीकिंग हियर now the weather is inclement it's raining so the number is not great but then there is a very small incident our my predecessor one of my predecessor in delhi swami budhanand ji he was a great thinker considered a extremely contemplative monk so he used to handle the delhi university gita class One day he went and saw that uh, there were very few people for that morning class, and so one of the organizers he was little upset. He said to Maharaj, "When the few have come, he said, 'Don't worry, Gita was told by Sri Krishna to Arjuna alone. There was only one person listening to him, so at least there are more. So today I think in that sense quite a few have turned up. So you know we are supposed to talk today about." Sri Ramakrishna. Talking about Sri Ramakrishna is like trying to dive into an infinite ocean, unfathomable ocean. And many of us also, as Sri Ramakrishna used to say, like a salt bowl trying to measure the ocean. We get dissolved, but if we get dissolved in Sri Ramakrishna Bhava, I think that is worth getting dissolved. So you know, Swami Ji, Swami Vivekananda, during his Parivrajik days, you know, there is a very famous incident when he went to Pavani Bhava to get initiated, and after several tries, it was impossible because every time Sri Ramakrishna would appear mystically before him, and then without saying anything, would plead with him through his. that kind of uh, facial expression and looks that swami ji was virtually prevented from going ahead with his resolve ultimately he gave up the idea and wrote in a letter to someone that shrankshna has no peers no where has the world seen such extraordinary depths of spiritual dimensions and at the same time such compassion for the Man in bondage. So you know, in one of our ashramas, I was talking about Sri Ramakrishna's supreme compassion. The speaker who spoke after me was presiding over the function. He chose to differ. He said that you know, we all know about that famous incident in Sri Ramakrishna's room at the Kshineshwar. As Sri Krishna talked about the three Vaishnava tenets, and after uttering the words compassion to Jeevas, Jeevay Daya, he became immersed in a transcendental state of Bhava Samadhi. And when he came down, he said, "What man was such an insignificant creature, like a worm? How can he show compassion to another? It is not compassion, but Sri Krishna said." Jeev Shiva, serving man, looking upon him as a veritable manifestation of God. So we might have ended there, but then that set me thinking, and I found an answer in my own way. What Sri Ramakrishna said in the room at the Kshineshwar, well, that applies to Jeevas. As a Jeeva. Obviously, you cannot show compassion to anybody. 
But God coming down on earth itself is out of supreme compassion. There is no denying that. I don't think Sri Ramakrishna ever used that with respect to himself, but it's with respect to the general, uh, the common jivas who are obviously insignificant and not endowed with such power. So, as far as Sri Ramakrishna himself is concerned, obviously, as an avatar who came down on earth for the regeneration of mankind, in fact, that is a very singular feature of avatar, God taking human form and coming down, that is definitely out of supreme compassion. Now, we know many, many uh, instances, the common prayer that we offer, Anita, Sharanam Nasti, Tvameva, Sharanam Mavar, Tasma, Karunya Bhavena, Raksha Raksha Maheshwar. Even while composing the Pranam Mantra of Sri Ramakrishna, that's why Swamiji said, Niranjanam Nityam Ananta Rupam Bhakta Anukampa Dhrita Vigraham. We took the human form, Dhrita Vigraha, Bhakta Anukampa, out of compassion for the devotees. In fact, even in the famous sloka of Gita, in the 10th chapter, 11th sloka, it says, Tesham evan kampartha ahma jnana jam tamaha Nashyani atma bhavastu jnana dhipena bhavastu So when it is after compassion, I remove the ignorance, a jnana of the devotees out of the supreme light of knowledge. So I think uh, that's something we should clearly bear in mind. The compassionate aspect of God coming down on earth. Otherwise, how would you justify, how would you justify Purna Brahma condensing itself into a small human form and coming down and going through all the motions of an earthly life, suffering, dukkha, the disease. So much Sri Ramakrishna had to endure on the mortal plane Obviously, that was out of supreme compassion. Not only really that, even after his coming down from the state of supreme nirvikalpa samadhi, there was no occasion for him to come down. He himself said that after 21 days in a nirvikalpa samadhi, the human body drops off automatically. But then, in the case of exceptional beings, endowed with very special powers, who had specially come down for the welfare of humanity. They survive, they come back, and then in various ways they live. For example, in the case he was asked to live in Bhavamukha by the Divine Mother herself. So that is how Sri Ramakrishna continued to live on this earth. So it's very clear at every stage Sri Ramakrishna's life on earth itself was an exhibition of his supreme compassion for the human souls, particularly the devotees and sadhakas. So, then, you know, in his life, there are many, many instances where this was exhibited, and that Leela, the divine play, continues. Even now, the, big, the spectrum of devotees were attracted to Sri Ramakrishna from every corner of the world, so to say. This phenomena cannot be explained unless we take this idea of his own supreme compassion, he is attracting them towards him, towards himself, so as to liberate them, to show them the path of mukti or liberation. A couple of uh, incidents from the lives of those who have come in contact with Sri Ramakrishna, but perhaps explain this idea better. You all know these incidents, only thing is when we see them in a context, they seem to make certain things clear. That's why we refer to those incidents. For example, you take the life of Kalipada Ghosh, you know how his uh, wife was so much tormented by him for years, he was a drunkard, and finally she heard of a holy man living in Dakshineswar, and came in search of Sri Ramakrishna. Sri Ramakrishna just out of fun sent her to Holy Mother, and Holy Mother sent her back to Sri Ramakrishna. After going back and forth between Sri Ramakrishna and Holy Mother, finally Holy Mother 
out of again compassion, wrote something on a milver leaf and gave it to her. And from that day, there was a visible change in the life and attitude of Kalipada Ghosh. But then he didn't come to Sri Ramakrishna immediately. Perhaps years later he came. And when he met him, Sri Ramakrishna instantaneously said, you have come here after tormenting your wife for 21 years. And Kalipada Ghosh was stunned. And not only that, Sri Ramakrishna knew his weakness for the drinks. So he said, would you like to have a drink? So he was shocked. Oh, it's available here also. And he readily agreed. And Sri Ramakrishna further went on to ask whether you would like to have a deshi or a videshi, whether it's an Indian or a foreign brand. And he gladly opted for a foreign brand. I mean, the difference was in the quality of intoxication, obviously. And Sri Ramakrishna just touched him, and that was the end of it. He was uncontrollably shedding tears, and nobody could uh, control him until Sri Ramakrishna himself touched him again, and then he came back to normal consciousness. But you know, some of these drunkards, they are also extremely intelligent people, just like Girish Ghosh. Very quickly he found out that here is a person who can really take me across the ocean of samsara. So he was really waiting for an opportunity. And one day he came, he came with a boat to Dakshineswar. He knew that Sri Ramakrishna would sometimes go to Calcutta to visit his devotees and he would use a boat for a transport. So that day Sri Ramakrishna said that I have to go to Calcutta. He immediately said, oh, the boat is ready, it is anchored here itself. You can come in my boat. So Sri Ramakrishna innocently came and he got into the boat. He had already told the person who was managing it, the boatman. He quickly took it to the middle of the Ganges. Sri Ramakrishna was stunned. Hey, what are you doing? What are you doing? Because no, he was not supposed to go to the mid Ganges. He was supposed to go along the uh, little and the shallow waters up to the Calcutta destination. Then Kalipada Gaur simply fell at his feet and caught hold of both his feet. Sri Ramakrishna simply became <laughs> nervous. Because suddenly this man has brought me to the middle of the Ganges and then he has fallen at my feet, he is catching hold of both my feet and saying that. Are you please leave me? No, 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 I won't leave. Then what do you want? I have led such a life. I know at the time of death I will only see darkness. You promised me that you would come with a lantern in one hand and hold my other hand and lead me to the ultimate destiny. Sri Ramakrishna was moved and he granted his prayers. But Kalimata goes, end was also extraordinary. He really became a great devotee and he would shed tears in the name of God. So that is how Sri Ramakrishna, see you know, normal sadhakas, people who are taking to spiritual life, they are progressing, they are going ahead, that's okay. But you know, this kind of total 180 degrees turnaround. People who are totally disinclined towards the spiritual pursuit of life. Bringing them, attracting them, and then showing them the way. That is where this extraordinary power, the power which arises due to the compassion, feelings of compassion in the heart. That's so clearly, so beautifully exhibited. If we know how Chaitanya Mahaprabhu liberated Jagai and Madai, so, you know, in the case of Avatar, as you can clearly see, this is a very, very important characteristic of the advent on earth. Of course, we all know too well the story of Girish Ghosh, how a bohemian was completely changed and transformed. So much so, you know, at one point of time, when Sri Ramakrishna was alive, instead of said, devotees are going, why don't you go and take bath in the Ganges? He would say, no, no, if I go and take bath, Ganga will become impure. He would not go. 
But long after Sri Krishna is passing away, somebody saw him going for a Ganges bath. He said, hey, where are you going? When Tagore himself used to say, you refuse, where are you going? Now I am going because by his touch, I have been so transformed, by taking bath, I will purify the Ganga. That was the conference of the person. Not only really that, he spent his last days in the Banaras Sivasrama and sadhus, after morning, early morning, 3-3.30, they go for Ganges bath, Vishwana darshan and then come straight to Girish Kursh. You would say, can there be a more greater exhibition of magical power than this, than someone like me, who led such a life, today, the all announcing monks, they are coming to have my darshan. So that was, I mean, there are, the story of Sri Ramakrishna's life was replete with many, many such examples. One more, a small example I would like to place before you before we go further. That's the case of, you know, this uh, Gaurima. You know, she led a very extraordinary life, even from a very young age. And you know, she was virtually a yogini. So you know, she never married or something. And then she probably, you know, he joined a band of wandering monks. She herself was wearing off her clothes, probably. And then somehow, finally, his uh, people came to know of her stay in Vrindavan. And then using her mother's name, he somehow brought her back. So she was uh, uh, doing her sadhana. And then you know, she had a Damodar Shila, which a sadhu, uh, which, a, which a nun had gifted her when she was young. She said, this is my dearest, my greatest of positions, my object of worship, Ishta Devata. But today I am leaving it with you because I feel you deserve to keep it. So from a young age she was uh, worshipping the Damodar Shila. So somehow Balram Bose came to know her and he said, why don't you come and meet uh, Sri Ramakrishna? He said, I have seen enough of these sadhus and yogis. If she is that great, why not he attract me? That's what she said. And then Balram was naturally went away. Then after some days, one day after bathing that uh, Damod Shushila, she took it in her hand and then when she was about to place it, she saw two living feet on the plate where the Damod Shushila was to be kept. She was overwhelmed and she fell unconscious. The vision was so powerful, it completely shook her and uh, she was experiencing tremendous spiritual upsurges within. Again, Master the Balrambo suggested that you come and meet Sri Ramakrishna. She came reluctantly, but even when she entered Sri Ramakrishna's room, he saw he was winding a thread or a stick. Then she understood perhaps this is how he was attracting me. I said that let him attract me. And then when she fell down at his feet, when she offered pranam, she saw the very feet which she had seen in her vision, in her puja room, these were the very feet. She was so moved. And then, you know, again she came next day. And then she said, you are so near, I have been searching you all over. Then Sri Ramakrishna said, you see, it is good. Otherwise, you would not have done so much of sadhana if you had got me much earlier. So, you know, you know her life, how it was transformed, how she led an extraordinary life. Her death was also extraordinary. That's a different story altogether. So, you know, the avatara, Sri Ramakrishna as an avatara of God, in innumerable ways, he had attracted out of compassion. So, you know, what stands out? is the extraordinary redeeming power of an avatara, taking people from any strata of society. There may be great sadhakas or sadhikas like Gorima and others, or they can be bohemians like Girish Kosh or Kalipada Ghosh. It doesn't matter at all. Just like uh, 
such an extraordinary powers of spiritual strength, any person could be taken and molded into a supremely spiritual way of life by an avatar. So obviously this is a great uh, idea. So that is why, you know, when uh, Swami Vivekananda talks about him as avatar avarishta, it was not just uh, in praise of Sri Ramakrishna, or it was not out of emotion, because Swamiji never accepted that idea very easily. In fact, towards his last days, once in his room, Sri Ramakrishna himself hinted to him. You know, um, some people call me as God incarnate on earth. He said, let thousand people call you. I won't believe unless I see it for myself. Obviously, Swamiji must have had such powerful spiritual experiences, transcendental experiences, that he later on wrote about him as Avatara Varishta. Of course, one of the instances we all know how just a few days before his giving up his mortal coil, Swamiji just thought, if at this moment, if he declares who he is, then I will believe him. And instantaneously, Sri Ramakrishna, like a lightning, came the answer. Narayan, even now you have disbelief. Akuna Abhishasya. He who came as Rama, he who came as Krishna, is in this body as Rama Krishna, but not in your Vedantic sense. So, you know, perhaps it was not the only occasion. There must have been several occasions which neither Sri Ramakrishna nor Narendra or Swami Vivekananda had ever shared with others. So there must have been such experiences in Swamiji's life that he became the greatest carrier, messenger of Sri Ramakrishna's message. Not only really that, he was absolutely convinced and not only really that, you know, he was too like a solid rock even when he came back from the West and they would talk about the other disciples expressing doubt about his uh, spreading Sri Ramakrishna's message in a particular manner. He said, what do you know about Sri Ramakrishna? How much have you known him? How much have you understood him? He was a person of infinite moods, Ananta Bhavamoy. So, so on and so forth. So all that perhaps led him to mention in the Pranam Mantra, he was Avatar Varishthaya. Ramakrishna Ayati Rama. He was the supreme avatars, one of the greatest of avatars. Of course, each avatar when he comes, he comes with an extraordinary mandate with some very special, specific objectives and so on. Swami Bhagavad himself says, you know, when someone asked him about the nature of the Lord or God Supreme, so he said that no sadhu or sadhaka can claim that power. That is his uh, capacity to alter the destiny of people as Kapala Mochana. So, you know, he clearly said that this power is only with the avatars. And in that sense, he said Sri Ramakrishna was a person who could clearly alter the destinies of people. You now, we all know how that we are all bound by our previous births, karmas, the accumulated sanskaras, the karma phala and all that in the yoga it is called as you know uh, the sanchita. So you know the sanchita karmas they lead to fresh births and in that we experience the results of the previous births called prarabdha. So you know an avatara is an exceptional spiritual luminary, who is capable of completely altering the destiny of any person, whomsoever he wants to grace, whomsoever he wants to liberate that. So some of these cases like, you know, Kalipada Ghosh, Girish Ghosh, etc. clearly come under that category, where there was a total turnaround from an extremely bohemian way, a bohemian way of life to really reaching such heights of spiritual illumination. Obviously, then not only that, you know, even Holy Mother used to say, even, even fate, even destiny 
cannot take my children to the Netherworlds or Prasadhari. So, you know, of course, that is the assurance, that is the power of Avatara, because you know, there is a small story. It seems Vashishta once came to know that one of his most favorite disciples, he was to die at a very young age. And he was such a powerful saint, such a great soul. He said, let me go and rewrite his, uh, that Lipi, Tamrabhatra. So then he went in search of that and he, he went and probably approached uh, Brahma, Indra, somebody, and he was so, shown a huge pile, millions and millions of such documents. So he said searching because he was very keen, the only few days were left according to the earlier prediction for the death of his favorite disciple. He went and searched and searched and searched and finally at the end of the moment, at the very last second, it was a time it was predicted that the disciple would die, he just caught hold of it, he lifted the document in his hands and that very moment the disciple died, as it was written, the moment his guru lifts his, uh, this lippy in his hands, that very moment the disciple would die. So you know that they say how powerful is the prarabdha, oh, it's just to show that. But you know, those who take shelter in a very powerful personality like an avatara, it's possible because you know, all sadhakas, quite often how we feel lost in our struggles, how in spite of our superhuman efforts too, quite often people find that it is difficult to get rid of the samskaras, the puru janma, karma phalas and all that. But you know, if one has that kind of a tremendous faith and spirit of surrender to that avatara, it's possible to really overcome that and turn a new leaf and really reach one's spiritual destiny or goal. So you know, regarding the functioning of the avatara itself, how does he really help mankind, humankind to evolve? Again, this can be discussed from two, three angles. One is that Sri Ramakrishna himself says that avatara is a kind of doorway between the finite and the infinite. He is on the threshold, he is positioned in such a way. People in the world who are suffering, who are in and through ever so many struggles time and again, they have an access. At the same time, using him, they can even have access to the other side. So you know, that's why he is positioned in the threshold, the doorway. That's why the Divine Mother himself commanded him to live, stay in Bhava Mukha, which is between the two worlds. Where he was, you know, he was positioned in such a way that he could at moment's notice go there and be in tune with that infinite and then come down and be in touch with the martyrs in a plane of duality and then give them assurance, give them the way of regeneration and so on. Sri Ramcha himself gives a beautiful example, you know, there is a huge grounds on both sides and between there is a wall. So this wall is that which is dividing the finite and the infinite, the normal mortal plane and the transcendental region. And you see there is a hole in that wall, through that one can access or see the other side. So when someone asked, who is, what do you think about the hole, when that person said, you are that hole, Sri Krishna felt extremely happy. Thereby he meant that the avatars are like that hole in that wall, their ego, their that feelings, that is that which really helps mankind to access the other side, other friends, or the grounds on the other side. So you know this is one, but then how do you really uh, bring it down into uh, some kind of a practicality? How do you really work it out? What really happens? Perhaps you know we get a beautiful clue in the words of Mahapush Maharaj. He said, Sri Ramakrishna came to awaken the Kundalini of the entire world. Jagate Kula Kundalini Jagran He came to awaken the Kula Kundalini of the humanity, entire world. It's a very, very big statement. You know, normally we know we have heard of Kundalini lying dormant 
at the Muladhara Chakra and then it's awakened and it goes through the Shishuna mark and all that reaches the Sarastara where one merges with the Paramatman and then at that level there is a extraordinary spiritual experiences and so on. So we know that in terms of the individual sadhaka's life. What did really Mahabharata Maharaj mean by this, this extraordinary awakening of the Kula Kundalini? Perhaps this is another extraordinary feature of Sri Ramakrishna's life, is being a very special avatar, avatar of Arishta. You know, Sri Ramakrishna is credited with being an extraordinary exponent of the idea of harmony. There are several dimensions of Sri Ramakrishna's harmony, which we discussed elaborately in the Srivindrapal Memorial Lecture. But then, you know, this idea with regard to religious harmony, that how Sri Ramakrishna can be an extraordinary focus of harmony of religions all over the world. Now, we know today a large number of people from all parts of the globe, they take to Sri Ramakrishna and take to him in a very extraordinary sense. Now we know how is it, in what way this can be explained, how this phenomena can be really explained. Now we know, according to the Hindu Sastra, we often quote in our talks about this religious harmony, it's a very ancient Hindu idea, which says, Ekam Satvipra Bhavuda Vadanti, Truth is when sages call it variously. Now you know again, this concept is perhaps accepted within the Hindu fold. Even then there is a lot of disputes because the Vaishnavas don't accept the Shastra's idea of ultimate. The Saivites don't accept Vaishnavas idea of ultimate. You know the famous um, Krishna being the Khandari and Mother saying that I can hire him as a boatman, any boatman I need not Krishna and so on. See, the kind of disputes or the differences of opinion or the tremendous sense of animosity that prevails between the followers of different sects of Hinduism itself, that clearly says that although at the ultimate idea, the Hindu idea of Ekam Sattvipra Bhagavad Bharati is proclaimed and talked about, obviously, it does not cut eyes ex ex even really powerfully even with the, within the fold of Hinduism. That's why there is so much of uh, disharmony, difference of opinion and so on. So how would a follower of another religion accept this idea? Now, if a person doesn't accept Vedas at all, doesn't accept the supremacy of this idea itself, obviously a follower of Islam or a Christianity obviously is not going to say this. So, you know, in that sense only, the Sri Ramakrishna's idea of harmony is extraordinary because he clearly saw the difference of opinion really exists when people talk about the ultimate. According to one Christianity, this is the ultimate. According to Islam, this is the ultimate. According to Hinduism, this is the ultimate. So, what some person, what a sadhaka, what a true practitioner, what a true believer, what he achieves at the end of it, at the end of a spiritual journey, that is where there is so much of difference and so much of uh, dispute and so on. So Sri Ramakrishna clearly sidestepped this whole idea and he clearly said that it's not necessary to worry about what happens at the ultimate. Now this he said because he clearly practiced the supreme disciplines according to several phases, and then in every case he reached the ultimate. He never said that the ultimate experience at every every approach, according to every approach, is one and the same because the ultimate experience is ultimate. That cannot be explained in words. He himself said Brahman alone has not become a chishta. Soil, it cannot be expressed in words. So that also, you know, goes with our scriptural idea. Edo vacho nivartante aprapya manasasaha where the mind and speech etc. cannot go. And it is something so fundamental and so rudimentary because 
whatever we do, whatever we strive, whatever we try to express and so on, they all belong to the domain of the senses. And how do you exactly describe that which is a beyond senses experience, that's a transcendental experience, that which is an Athenry experience, Anubhuti, how that can be exactly described when you come down to the mundane world? Obviously that's going to fall far short of the ultimate experience. So, you know, that is very, very clear. You know, for example, even in uh, normal, our work at the world, this daily experience, supposing all of us, our Siddhartha arranges a couple of huge air conditioned buses for us and takes us, a very beautiful scenery, it's a natural scenery, it's very much praised, uh, something very new. Supposing all of us go and spend the same amount of time and come back and sit in this hall and then we are asked to share our experiences, Obviously, it's not going to be exactly the same. Each person will have his own little flavor. If that is so, with regard to an experience of the senses, what can you say about an experience beyond the senses? First, Ramakrishna clearly saw that although when he experienced the highest according to each part, he knew that he had gone beyond the senses. That was something so full, so extraordinary, Satyam Shivan Sundaram, Satyam Jnanam Anandam Brahma, whatever you call it, that is something truly indescribable. The peace that passes understanding. It's that kind of an experience. He knew that when you come down and try to give expression to it, that is going to fall short of the ultimate reality. So that is why he said, he completely changed the focus. He said, you focus on sadhana. You focus on spiritual striving. Accept that there is an ultimate goal to be achieved beyond senses, beyond this mundane experience. Strive for that. That alone is important. And that is why you could unite the entire world in that sense. Whether you are a Christian or a Muslim or a follower of Jainism or a or follower of Buddhism or any sect of Hinduism, no one can deny that one has to strive in an extraordinary way if one is to go beyond the senses or if one is to reach the ultimate goal of life. That being so, by simply shifting the emphasis and not talking about the ultimate experience, even when one is far, far below that goal, it's like a class one student talking about a doctorate in physics or chemistry. It's as childish as that. You strive, you work hard, you try to reach the goal of life. That's much more important than everything else. Now what happens at that point of time? Why this is such a unifying idea? Because if a person is interested in his sadhana, he has no time to look this way or that way. He has no time to indulge in any dispute or any disharmony. Because he is so possessed by the idea of sadhana, so possessed with the idea of ultimate goal of life, obviously there is no scope for any dispute or disharmony. And that is why he could bring the entire humanity under the umbrella of sadhana. So in that sense, Sri Ramakrishna coming to awaken the Kura Kundalini of the earth, he gave the impetus for sadhana. If anyone is a sadhaka, Relying on this extraordinary spiritual principle or spiritual storehouse, dynamo of Sri Ramakrishna, spiritual wisdom and capacity of power, each sadhaka, wherever he is, coming under whichever religion or coming under whichever umbrella, can take to an intense life of sadhana and ishtaku. So I think this is a very extraordinary contribution of Sri Ramakrishna and this is a very special feature in Zavatarhood. And perhaps I think we get a glimpse of it in Mahapushma's idea that he came to awaken the Kula Kundalini. So actually awakening in the Kula Kundalini, in one sense, that is an initiation, that is a beginning of a true spiritual pursuit, a true spiritual goal of life. So coming, or Sri Ramakrishna's coming, is to awaken this idea of sadhana through the entire universe and bringing under the umbrella all those who are interested in serious sadhana, they become a band, they become fellow travelers. That is how they are united in harmony. And there is no dispute between religions because everyone is a sadhaka. As a sadhaka, you may be a Christian sadhaka or an Islam sadhaka or a Hindu sadhaka. As a practitioner, you are one with everyone else. 
And pretty that, you know, he gave a very beautiful idea. That's why, you know, again, which is very special in Sri Ramakrishna's life. If you see Sri Ramakrishna's life of the period as a sadhaka, the initial breakthrough was what he really struggled. And after that, any experience, it just took him a matter of days, three days at the most. So Tabri said that what I had to struggle for 40 years. Here is a person, it just in three days, not in three days, these were just moments. The moment he said, concentrate here and trust that piece of glass in between his eyebrows and said, you concentrate here. That moment he dived into such deep samadhi, three days he didn't come out of that. So he didn't even take three days for him to realize that highest nirvik of the samadhi or the highest idea of Iraka Brahman, which Tathapari realized. So that means, you know, he had such a powerful instrument, such a powerful weapon in his hands, wherever he wanted to go, wherever he wanted to traverse, whichever path he chose, he could simply go unhindered in his own way. And that instrument in his case was this Vyakulata. Again, I do not know, amongst you, Satyada, maybe you will be able to say, in our Shastras, or nowhere in the world, is so much special emphasis is laid on this particular word called Vyakulata. Even in Bhakti Shastra, so many books there are various definitions of Bhakti. But this is something very extraordinary with Sri Krishna coin he developed, he practiced and left behind for the entire humanity to follow. Because now if you take some of the classical definitions of uh, bhakti, the Narada Bhakti Sutra gives what is Parabhakti. Parabhakti says, Tadarpita Akila Acharata Tad Vismarani Parama Vyakulata. Offer all your actions, whatever you do unto the Lord. And if there is even a momentary lapse in the linkage with the Supreme. You experience unbearable pain, unbearable sufferings. Probably, you know, Sri Krishna's Vyakulata can't even be put in that category. It is even beyond that because here, you know, at least as long as you offer, that means till you perform, till you indulge in actions, definitely there is a sense of semblance of identity, semblance of ahankara, semblance of kattutva, both in a sadhaka in that sense. Only at the end of it, he constantly offers to the Lord. Whereas Sri Ramakrishna's extraordinary idea of this Bhava Mukha, I mean, the extraordinary idea of Vyakulata, there absolutely there is a total erasure of this idea of I. Such extraordinary feeling of pain, of separation from the Divine, from the Ishta, from the object of worship, the supreme chosen ideal. Even life was insignificant. There was nothing absolutely, there is a total wiping out of the individual, so to say. That kind of a supreme longing for God is the ultimate. That led him to the first vision. And after that, everything was just a matter of days. So, you know, that's why he said, the longing in your heart, the supreme feeling of that kind of a Back home, that kind of a pain, that kind of an attitude, that kind of, what would I say? That was what he, he said was the prerequisite. That was the one aspect, one qualification, one quality. You know, you know some a disciple asked a guru what it was. He said, you took him to a, uh, some a pond or somewhere and just forcefully he must his head into it and then when he took out, he said, how was it? I was feeling breathless, I was about to die. So that kind of an intense longing, that kind of a longing for God, that's what Sri Ramakrishna says. So, you know, in that sense, Sri Ramakrishna has taken every idea of sadhana. That is why, you know, he, is, he has gone beyond scriptures. So, where you know, Sri Ramakrishna said, the experiences of this place have gone beyond Ved Vedanta. Probably, you know, it has many interpretations, many dimensions. One dimension is, because of this one singular idea of Vyakura, you could unite the entire world and go beyond all scriptures. Whether you are following a Bible or a Quran or a Veda or any other scripture, anybody could go in beyond that idea. So, you know, the ultimate idea of spiritual sadhana experience, everything you put it even beyond the realm of so-called sastras, 
in that sense that with this one singular idea, if that is accepted, that was an enough powerful instrument to take one up to one's spiritual destiny. So you know, it's possible, that is why you know many of the followers of Sri Krishna also, they did not have to really give up what was inherent to them, what was so close to them. In a very unique way, he would bless them. I will close with a beautiful incident from, incident from Raja Mahara's life. As if that is so in the case of Raja Mahara, you can understand how million fold would have been in the case of Sri Ramakrishna. Raja Mahara's was in Chennai at that time. And uh, you know, uh, Sister Devamata was, was, was also staying there. And she was very close to Ramakrishna Nandri. Maharaj was also there. Then Christmas was approaching. A few days before Christmas, Raja Maharaj told her, Sister, we shall go and observe Christmas Eve in your house. She was simply overwhelmed with joy. She didn't know what to do. So that day, a whole day from morning, she was so busy decorating. She had beautifully decorated everything, put up a very nice shrine with the picture of uh, Christ and Madhana and so on. And then, you know, she had made all arrangements, candles, uh, offerings and so on. So Raja Maharaj and the sadhus came. And then, Devamada started reading from the Bible. Suddenly everyone saw Raja Maharaj's eyes were somewhere. They have gone beyond this earth. They were in some transcendent religion. He was just staring somewhere at the, at the vacant region. Everybody stopped. There was a standing silence for about 10 minutes or so. Then Raja Maharaj's eyes came down. They saw that he was returning to a kind of normal consciousness and he waved his hand. The reading continued. Offerings were given, candles were waved and so on. And then at the end of it, Sadhus sat down for the prasada. So when they were serving, the mother said, Maharaj, I am so blessed today that you came. But immediately Maharaj said, Sister, it is we who are blessed. Why Maharaj? You know when you are reading the Bible, I saw Christ standing at the very place near the picture in the altar in a long blue coat and he talked to me for ten minutes. No, sir, she was so touched. You see, that is extraordinary harmonizing way of Sri Ramakrishna. He did not give her the Gopala Darshan or something else. Through this vision of the Christ, you know, you can imagine how a follower in the path of Christianity, how her own faith would have become hundredfold without giving up an inherent drift, an inherent tendency for proceeding in a particular line and yet coming close to Sri Krishna and taking advantage of Sri Krishna's this idea of sadhana. That is why Mahabhishma said he came to awaken the Kula Kundalini of the entire humanity. So I think on this auspicious Eve, let us pray to Sri Krishna that he accepts all of us. He gives us the tendency to do sadhana, taking cues from his extraordinary life. And then slowly, let him lead us to the ultimate destiny of life. Shri Ramakrishna.